You're listening to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Classic Gamers Guild Podcast. Just before we begin today's episode, I just wanted to announce that... Sorry. <clears throat> Just before we begin today's episode, I just wanted to announce that the Classic Gamers Guild will be hosting a fundraiser on Saturday, March 28th, because March is National Kidney Awareness Month, and we want to raise awareness and funds for kidney disease and kidney health. All proceeds will benefit Stephen Alexander of Infamix Quests. They made Quest for Infamy, Order of the Thorn, and the upcoming Frog Sheen. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, stay tuned for updates and announcements, and come on out and hang out and donate for a really good cause. But in the meantime, we did lose Paul this week, but we did gain two others to join us this week. I think it's overall an improvement. Sorry, Paul. But we have the <laughs> lovely Sarah Kelly and uh, the lovely Anna Vigu, who is Hi. back again after joining us for the episode that we did on the Jesuit Larry a little while ago. Uh, welcome to the show, ladies. Hello, hello. Thank you. Hey, Rick. And in fact, at time of recording, this is International Women's Day. So um, congratulations on being women. You guys are totally <laughs> empowered and there's nothing left. There's no sexism left in the world. No, we oh, saw that. Yeah. I because, just got because a participation you have, trophy. <laughs> <laughs> because you have a day of the year, um, <laughs> it, everything is fixed. So you're welcome. Yay. That was us. That was, we did that. Yeah. <laughs> you guys. Yes. Thanks, guys. Yes. <laughs> I would say it is cool that we're doing this game today, though. Indeed, mm -hmm. yes, because we are, we have had a streak. Um, it's kind of been a running joke between me and Paul that uh, considering our particular topic of choice, we've never actually covered it. We rarely ever mention King's Quest on the show. And uh, it kind of eventually got to the point just because we wanted to keep the streak going. But now, you know, this was an appropriate time to say, hey, you know what was actually a good King's Quest that I really enjoyed was King's Quest 4. So I thought I would bring a couple of friends who, like me, also grew up playing King's Quest 4. Well, you know, uh, I think that this game should be talked about more because by the time it came out in 1988, it had sold as a series over 800,000 copies, which back then was like a huge deal. Mm -hmm. And I mean, to top it off, it's done by a female developer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is like, yeah, this is totally the International Women's Day episode, basically. <laughs> uh, everything about it was like, you know, um, female protagonists. I, I can't really think of very many before King's Quest Four came out where the protagonist was actually a woman. There... Yeah, I'm having a hard time thinking of any. Mm -hmm. They're in the catalog. I was looking. I'm like, there must be another one. I'm like, okay, so let's pull out the 1988 Sierra catalog. And there was Space Quest 1, 2, and 3. No. Police Quest <laughs> 1 and 2. Definitely no. Leisure Suit Larry 1 and 2. Again, there was women in the game. Uh, Gold Rush. <laughs> but clearly between Police Quest and Leisure Suit Larry, there was like strong female <laughs> characters all throughout, right? <laughs> they were strong. I mean. <laughs> Physically. They would kick your butt, yep, or mine. So yeah, there was not a lot of women out there. And I mean, there were other female game devs-ish. Uh, Christy Marks didn't start making games uh, until 1990. There was Lori Hopping, but she did educational games and stuff. So you're not like, wow, I can't wait to get the next Lori Hopping game. Yeah. Uh, there was uh, for Glory wasn't until the next year. That's correct, so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when did you all first play King's Quest IV? My dad brought it home. My dad worked for IBM uh, in the 80s. And so we had just almost every incarnation you could think of of the early personal computer in our house. Um, and one day dad brought this game home and we played it together. And so that was kind of a fun father-daughter bonding kind of a thing. And for me, that was my very first adventure game. Um, he thinks it was King's oh, Quest wow. 2, but I'm sure it was King's Quest 4. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember we used to go um, on Prodigy on the bulletin boards looking for hints and clues because we didn't have access to a hint book at that time. I don't know. Did they have one for this game? Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually right on the same line as you, Sarah. My dad brought this game home randomly, and, and I'm pretty sure like I, I must have been 
about almost 11. He brought it home in 89, and uh, it was my first cursor-based game. So I, I'd never actually mm. used the mouse to control a game, and I was like totally clueless. So my dad and I are sitting there, and we're we're clicking Rosella and dragging the mouse forward while holding down the button, and she's falling off that stupid cliff over and over <laughs> and over and i'm like i i don't understand and eventually we got it you point and you click and because it was a novelty we continued to use the mouse instead of uh the keyboard right i mean it was so mm -hmm. cool you, you can click this thing on the screen and magically she goes to it i just i remember thinking that was so amazing yeah i'd, I'd never seen anything like it before and um it's funny because at the time i didn't think anything of the fact that it had a female protagonist and then mm -hmm. supporting roles, you know, Janesta and um, I never know how to say her name. Is the evil fairy Lolot or Lolot? What's the consensus? There? I always thought it was Lolotti, but I always oh, used to say yeah. Lolet, Lolotti. I like that though. Actually, it's even more evil. I might use that one now. <laughs> well, how, did, how did you <laughs> used to say it, Anna? I just said Lolette because I never understood that it was spelled slightly different than oh. Lolette should traditionally be spelled. <laughs> I didn't actually catch it till I was talking to Jamie in the guild and uh, she uh, spelled it correctly and I understood that I was wrong. Right. Well, well actually, sir, because I know that uh, you are a fellow theater person like I was, or like I used to be, not so much anymore. And I know that we... Um, both agree that we enjoy Phantom of the Opera. So that's actually how I came across with my pronunciation. Not that I really gave it much thought, but because uh, they sang about Little Lottie, oh. I just thought La Lottie. There you go. <laughs> and Anna, Little you're La a Lottie. Phantom fan too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, I <laughs> yeah, am. So you, you, know what I, you know what we're talking about. That totally makes sense mm -hmm. now. I never made that connection. But yeah, no, I'm in. I'm, I'm on that train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> uh, honestly, I think this was... Either the first or the second King's Quest I've ever played. I th I think the, f um, I think the first one might have been King's Quest One EGA, or uh, the SCI EGA, like the uh, the remake of King's Quest One. Oh, mm -hmm. I played that one a lot. In mm -hmm. fact, I think that's the only version of King's Quest One that I have completed. Right. Yeah. Actually, for completing, that is the only one that I've uh, of King's Quest One. Anyways, I did play the AGI original uh, earlier this year, and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it it was cool, but you know, I other than like King's Quest Four, uh, King's Quest has never really been my series. Mm -hmm. Same. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, why would you say why? Why do you think that is? Uh, because Quest for Glory got to me first. <laughs> oh, it's all in the timing. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. For me, I, this is the series that I hit first. So for a long time, I was King's Quest all the way, and mm -hmm. then I kind of got sort of pulled into the awesome vortex that is the quest for glory series so while it would be hard for me to choose a favorite I, for me this was kind of where i started so mm -hmm. i will always have a special place in my heart for these ones oh of course i mean i guarantee if i had started with king's quest it would have been a very different story but it was um for me i felt quest for glory was basically king's quest plus so it was kind of hard to go back <laughs> Yeah, I would say King's Quest is not my series, but King's Quest Four is definitely my game, being that it's the first, and so it meant a lot to me, and that I finished it myself without any hints, but oh my gosh, you guys, it took me a year and two months, and I never won the trip to England. No? Oh no! <laughs> oh, not you had the addition with the code. <laughs> I did the little pamphlet inside, yeah. yeah, no, or a Tandy computer, I didn't win that, nothing. We oh. had, yeah, we had one of the, the edition that had the little sticker on the outside when the trip to London, every time we finished it, it would pop up, you know, the secret code. But, uh, <laughs> sadly, we were too late. We were not uh, fast enough on that ball. So right. I didn't see that secret code until I was older because I never got full points uh, not having a walkthrough. I, I always missed stuff so that I didn't even know oh. it would pop up the secret code until I, I actually used a walkthrough in this my 20s. <laughs> actually entirely the first time I've ever even heard of this happening. Oh, really? Yeah. No, I, I never, especially with Sierra games, I never finished them with full points. Neither. I How think, do you do that? Who does I that? <laughs> I think Space Quest 1, um, I did like last year. I finally finished it with full points. And King's Quest, sorry, not King's Quest, Quest for Glory 4 was the only one I ever actually um, finished with full points. And I didn't even use a walkthrough for that. Although at that point, I was kind of familiar with the game 
Uh, so I kind of accidentally stumbled across all the points, but I kind of knew like the basic marks to hit. So I have a question that can be applied to this game or just literally any King's Quest game. Was there ever a was there a part that just caused you like strange amounts of anxiety? Because mm. I when I would play King's Quest Four as a kid, I going into that troll cave. My heart would be literally just pounding every single time because you knew that in any screen he could show up and then you were just dead. And it didn't matter, you know, if you're if you're two screens in, you, you can't get out if he appears. Mm -hmm. So for some reason that just I mean, even though there was literally no reason for me to be like absolutely terrified, that yeah. did that to me. <laughs> um so I'm curious, is there a place in, in any of these games that did that to you? Ooh, you know what? The place you're talking about, I had an amber monochrome screen. And, oh, uh, nice. It oh. was so dark in that cave, and you really didn't know where the, the chasm is. You also didn't know how to spell chasm until you played the game, I guarantee it. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> nope. my heart... <laughs> I knew how to spell it, I just didn't know how to pronounce it. I just went so long into life thinking it was a chasm. A chasm? So did yeah. I. I used I to think, think it was, it was a, a chasm, chasm too. too. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that place was super scary. And you know what? The graveyard where the trees were holding the axes. Like, Oh, yes. Yeah. I just, I, I didn't know mm -hmm. what to do about them at the beginning and there was nothing I could do to stop them from killing me. So it was, it was pretty scary. The mm -hmm. witches were scary. I mean, I think oh. most of my scary points are in that game. Pandora's box, that whole room was scary. Like That was us. actually, yeah, that was, that was actually <laughs> going to be my pick was, uh, Pandora's box. I mean, like I kind of deserved it for opening the thing. But then, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, you know, Everybody else did. Yeah. <laughs> but once it happened, I was like, wow, that escalated quickly. I just had to put it <laughs> off for a while and just be like, hey, I got to live with this for a bit. That was, <laughs> what have you done? Yeah, I don't know what I expected. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think when it comes down to it, this one, more so than any of the others, even though I, I thoroughly enjoyed, um, you know, King's Quest 1, uh, King's Quest 5, King's Quest 6 in particular, um, for some reason, this game caused mm -hmm. me the most emotional turmoil. Like, oh, true. So we're talking about being yeah. afraid, but then also I felt so much guilt for turning that unicorn over to Lolot or Lolotti <laughs> <laughs> or whatever we want to call her, like just absolute guilt. And I actually just played this maybe like a week or two ago, just randomly before you even asked me here. Mm -hmm. And, um, I still felt guilty. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> this poor 16 color unicorn, and I was turning her over to an evil fairy. Especially um, when you approach yeah. the unicorn at the very end when you're like rescuing the unicorn, and he's just like, Yeah, whatever, buddy. Yeah. yeah. Like, he, you he screwed just runs me off, over and now. you're like, Oh, <laughs> that relationship can never be repaired. So <laughs> I like yeah. that, though. It's like. <laughs> You, you know, Screw you, you, lady. even after you do, yeah, <laughs> even after you finish the adventure, it's just sort of like, stay away from me, <laughs> asshole. <laughs> yeah, you were the only person I've it's ever like, trusted and ever will trust now. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I hate all people forever now because of you. It's like, you don't get to, you don't get credits for rescuing me. You're the reason <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Oh, and being in the giant's house altogether from walking into the screen to being in their actual house to like sneaking around a sleeping giant. That was all very stressful. Oh, yeah. Getting the timing of that. I remember kind of sitting in there and you you kind of open a closet door and then you come out and you're just kind of waiting till you're at that right point to grab the chicken. And then you almost get to the door and then that next screen where you're trying to run away. It just, <laughs> oh. Uh, I, I did eventually need a walkthrough to get me through quite a lot of the game um but the one thing that sort of really threw me for a loop the first time i tried it was the um uh when you get the diamonds from the dwarves house and it's sort of like i thought they left that for me i thought that was a gift i didn't know i was supposed to try to return it to them <laughs> yeah like i'm gonna come back and clean tomorrow now for sure yeah. <laughs> I remember thinking, man, I wish cleaning was as easy as standing in front of a bed and just whirling your arms around and then it gets made. <laughs> it took her like 30 seconds, if that, to clean the entire house. I mean, that's that's yeah. a pretty awesome skill. I'm not going to lie. I played it on, I think it was a PC-10, uh, two, two <laughs> meaning that there was two floppy drive, drives mm -hmm. on it. And uh, cleaning of the house took like 
10 solid minutes. Yeah. I swear. Really? You're just like, I'm going to go make uh, a drink and grab some chips and go to the bathroom. Oh, look, the dwarves are coming in. Now she's serving them food and then they have to leave. It seemed really long. <laughs> I was actually like turning up the speed. Especially back in those days, yeah, it was really slow. If I actually played it on my Amber Monochrome, um, I'd, I'd probably still be watching it. Like it was, it's true. Yeah, you hear them play that do 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 over and over and over. Everyone's favorite earworm. Yep. But just imagine if they actually like decided to like make you clean the house in real time. Three hours okay, so later. I, yeah. Because you saying that, Anna, I have to confess to you an incredibly dorky game that my brother and I play sometimes. So um, there is a feature we discovered in the Facebook Messenger chat where you can hold the microphone down and make a little voice recording, and then it just auto-sends as soon as you're done recording. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember which one of us started this, but we would sing like annoying earworms from Sierra Games. <laughs> just like yes. a little 10-second snippet. Like, um, you know, like that, or uh, actually one of our favorites is the um, opening to the Black Cauldron, which is, if you have ever played that on something with just a PC internal speaker or something like that, yes, it is one of the most ear-piercing things I've ever heard, and that's nothing against the composer. I'm sure it's beautiful music when played on actual instruments, but that hurts. So, <laughs> 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 so every once in a while, I'll get like a really screechy recording of my brother singing something like that into the microphone on his phone. And, <laughs> that um, is sweet. Yeah. Oh, I think the first time I played this, we didn't have a sound card. So um, my first go through with King's Quest Four was just internal speakers. And then mm-hmm. when we got a sound blaster, um, that's the brand that we got. Um, and then it was all of a sudden just really beautiful. I really love the score for this game. I think yeah. it's really pretty. I think it, it definitely matches uh, the, the mood and tone of, of the art and the story. And um, it, it's a really good score. Mm hmm. Like yeah, the uh, tune that plays when the flying monkeys always capture you. <laughs> do, 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 do. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> I love it. Do, 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 do. <laughs> <laughs> that game was great for that. You you go up and you think you've done something wrong and now you're going to die and the game's going to end and the next thing you know, you're getting the story to go forward. You know, I, I think yeah. it was really unexpected in that way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you had kind of the three mini quests and... At the same time, you sort of felt like, why am I doing this? This feels wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Again, from a story perspective, when you look at the the first three King's Quest, they were good. Uh, they probably didn't, I would say they. this is the first one that delved a little bit, well, starting with, with King's Quest 3 um, and going into this one, we started to kind of delve into, you know, a little bit more of a deeper story. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Uh, that was one of the things I thought was kind of interesting about it. In this, she's making some morally gray decisions in in pursuit of the greater good, you know. Um, mm-hmm. and, and so I, I thought that was really interesting. That's kind of when we started to take our first steps into that. And now, I mean, uh, adventure games are just so incredibly complex. Uh, some of the things that have been coming out more recently, I'm thinking of uh, Dave Gilbert and Francisco Gonzalez, um, and uh, you have all kinds of shades of gray, and it's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's like this was the beginning mm-hmm. of that being able to happen. It wasn't just a straightforward storyline where you always yeah. did what's good. It's just you did what you needed to do to get the job done. Because damn it, your dad is sick, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Especially back then, too. Like nowadays, you know, you usually you'll be given a moral choice at some point. So, like, do you do the good thing or do you do the bad thing? But in this one, it's sort of like, well, you have to do the bad thing. It's like, what if I don't want to? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> do you want to see the end of the game? I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> Give the unicorn to that woman. <laughs> it's my unicorn, though. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, you know, it was the first game that I played. And uh, I remember I asked my dad, hey, what about King's Quest 1, 2, and 3? And he said, oh, no, those are the ones where you type and the game keeps going. And I said, oh, boy, well, I didn't want that. I wanted a game that paused when I was typing. So I went on and I played number five and I, I thought it was hard, but pretty good. And I played number six and it was whimsical and I, I absolutely adored it. And then mm-hmm. 
when it came out, I was older and I was into Quest for Glory. So I just mm. looked at it like a Quest for Glory kind of a game. And, and I, I don't think I quite finished it, but I do recall enjoying it. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't notice that the graphics were crappy because it was so 3D and I'm like, wow, this is kind of amazing. Mm-hmm. And I didn't care about continuity of storyline, clearly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but I went back uh, later on when I got uh, Korish's video game guide book and uh, finished one, two, and three just entirely using the walkthrough. So did I complete them? Yeah. But did I actually complete them? I guess not. Well, I don't know how people ever finish King's Quest 3 without a walkthrough, to be honest. Yeah, oh, I don't gosh. believe it. I don't believe it at all. No. Lies. Lies. Yeah. Has to be. I'm actually impressed uh, that you completed this one without a walkthrough because there were a couple things that, ah, gosh. I mean, we we completed it, like I said, using hints from people on, on bulletin boards online, but I don't know that I could have completed this on my own, at least not at that time. Um, yeah, actually, okay, that's a good question, though. What was the toughest puzzle in this one, would you say? Outside of just getting to the tree and getting past the troll, the actual puzzles... Figuring out that the whole getting swallowed by the whale was okay. (laughs) Oh, yeah. It accidentally happened to me and I was so upset because I'd been trying to avoid him. I already had issues with the shark. I didn't want to be swallowed and die anymore. So it it stressed me out. But then I I was okay. And I was in the whale and there was Easter eggs. So it was all right. (laughs) Yeah. What about you? Um, Well, let's see. I would say trying to figure out how to get out of the whale was really hard. I had the (laughs) hardest time climbing that whale tongue. I don't know what it was, but... So slippery. Yeah. And then, um, oddly enough, sometimes it was... I don't know if it was just parser logic or if I just didn't really understand how to ask the right questions. So, for example, getting the golden ball from under the bridge, I kept going, take ball you know, reach under bridge, things of that nature. And then I didn't realize I had to look under bridge for her to take it. Mm, Or trying to get the flute from Pan, I kept trying to trade the loot. And then it took me the longest time. And actually, that was like the first like puzzle that was difficult that I remember solving. I just played it. And then he was looking at me and paying attention to me. Um, So for me, this being my first text parser, I think my difficulty was trying to figure out what language would trigger the actual thing that I wanted to do. Yeah, Um, because you can't like be ask about, you know, like that was a phrase that it's like, I don't know what you're saying, ask about, I don't understand. And I'm like, but I need to ask about things so we can carry this conversation (laughs) forward. What do you mean you don't understand this command? Right. (laughs) But after growing up with games like these, now I'm like a pro. I was I was uh, going through the Crimson Diamond beta. And also, I mean, Julia has just been, has put together a phenomenal game and uh, mm-hmm. has, has really, really good, uh, you know, words in her lexicon. And, um, mm-hmm. but, you know, now going through that, you know, with something new, I feel like I know a little bit more about what I'm doing. Yeah, you're like, who needs that stupid ask about command anyways? Right? Because we're grown-ups now. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know what that is. Tell me. What's that? What's what's ask about? Oh, you know, like ask ask about about car, ask about about. about wife, ask about fishing rod, (laughs) ask about loot. (laughs) Ever used exactly that phrasing? Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I bet you a lot of us, uh, we interpreted the game in different ways. And, and like I said, I always had that little list of verbs open and sitting next to me like a mm-hmm. Bible when I was playing because I'm like, I just, I want to communicate with you so badly and I, you're <laughs> not getting what I'm trying to say. It's like, but with the ball, because it was amber monochrome, I didn't know anything was under the bridge. It was just like a little blip of color. So, of course, I'm like, look under bridge. Oh, cool. There's a a ball there. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, like I said, the uh, honestly, like there it was tricky. And I can't say that they were easy because I did obviously need walk through to get through um, quite a lot of it. But uh, as I mentioned before, I think the one that really would have stumped me if I hadn't uh, cheated was the whole, you know, giving the diamonds back to the dwarves. Cause I really just thought uh. that that was mine from now on. <laughs> 
I remember uh, I showed it to him and kept trying to talk to him, and he keep, kept on brushing me off, and, and I was so stuck there was nothing else I could do. I'm not even sure what prompted me to give it to him, but a big part of it was my dad helping. You know, my parents were super smart, so I would ask them questions about the game, and they would come up and watch me play and, and give me tips and ideas. So that kind of helped, even though they weren't really playing that game themselves. Mm-hmm. It's always fun when family gets involved and then you have kind of these conversations about, well, have you tried this or what about this? Or Mm -hmm. in the case of my husband watching me play Thimbleweed Park, just kind of like in the room and a passing comment. And it was like one of those moments in a detective show where you go, you're a genius. And then I (laughs) was able to solve. It was part of the um, part of the walking through the mountain trail um, uh, puzzle. And uh, yeah. I don't remember exactly what the offhand comment was, but I was like, sweet, I know what to do now. And That's awesome. So so you guys both have the big box, of course, of uh, King's Quest IV, I'm assuming. Yes. Like- I have it in front of me, in fact. Yes, I do. <laughs> so my favorite thing that I've learned about the big box version of this game is, of course, the picture of the three witches on the bottom right, because if you look at the box, you can see they're all hanging out outside of the cave being very intimidating. So uh, when I went to play the game, of course, I assumed they would follow me out of the cave. I would take their Mm. eye, not take their eye. But Ah. you know what? Funny thing was, they never left the cave, not even once. Right. Yeah. They stay inside. (laughs) (gasps) You're right. Oh my gosh. I don't know about you guys, but I didn't know about the uh, the Easter egg in the AGI version where they do the uh, King's Quest rap, or you float up into the sky and kind of hang out with the devs and can ask them questions a bit. That is not something I've ever known about before now. Everybody go and Google it if you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. Just type uh, <laughs> King's Quest for Easter egg, uh, King's Quest rap. It's, it's funny. I... Don't think I'll wrap it for you right now. No? But, uh, oh, no. I, oh, that would make me I? so happy. Well, why do you think I brought you on here? <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> I might, I might have written out the lyrics after watching the video. So, oh my gosh, well, I'm so go. excited right now. <laughs> I should have not done this ten minutes before the podcast. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> We are the King's Quest 4. Now we're out the door. The Burt wanted more. We said, what for? The gamer's already a sight to see. We ship the most discs in history. More <laughs> changes keep coming from the Burt every day, but we just had to say, no way. She went to Rick with changes to make. He said to her, give us a break. She continues on and gives him lip. Rick finally said, but Burt, it's been shipped. <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was beautiful. Thank you so awesome. much. Thank you just you. That, made that my that night. So yeah, totally look that up and uh, wish if if somebody well, I actually don't need to has now. you just did it. So <laughs> oh wait, yeah, that's the definitive version. But no, if it somebody is. does it have is, it yes. and can look it up and has seen it for real, it would be so cool if you could email the show and let us know because I don't think I've ever talked to anybody that has seen that uh, in the actual game instead of on a video. <laughs> that uh, is look, I'm sorry. fantastic. <laughs> now I'm just super enthusiastic over here. I was like pumping my fist while she was rapping. I was like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, you know, uh, just as I'm looking at the box now, I think this is a different box from the one that I had because um, um, this one says the over 800,000 sold, but I could swear that my old box actually said the um, uh, largest game ever made at three megabytes or whatever. Or actually, wait, no, it's on the back. Yeah. Over three megabytes of computer code, the largest computer game ever produced. Never mind. Mm-hmm. I thought it was right on the front, but it's on the back there. So never mind. But um, um, the thing I noticed also looking now is the expression on the unicorn's face um, makes a lot more sense to me now that I think about how much it really hates you. <laughs> and, yeah, it's not having a good day, is it? No. 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 Bad day. Hey, did you guys <laughs> notice that on the box art, uh, Rosella is a lot more true to fo- form than Graham is on the box art for King's Quest 1? <laughs> wait, wait, which are you talking about? The IBM PC Junior cover of King, of King's Quest 1? Yeah, like or is at it least like a it's... full suit of armor? Yeah, he, he's in a full uh... suit of armor and you're like, where's his armor? It's like they obviously had to save money. They couldn't afford to like pixel the armor on him or something. <laughs> 
her her dress is not the right color. See, that <laughs> so. always kind of threw me where I was like, that doesn't look right. I mean, it's cool. It's actually my desktop background right now, but it always bugged me when I was a kid that she didn't have the right costume on. Yeah, like who you know? wears all white to go adventuring in a foreign land? Like color it up a bit. Where's that red, yo? <laughs> it's like uh, it's like she's wearing a nighty or something. Actually, if you go by my version of this game, she should be all black and yellow. I don't understand the rest of these colors at all. <laughs> <laughs> See, I actually didn't know it could be played that way, and now I'm intrigued. <laughs> no, we actually played, gosh, we played King's Quest Two on a PC Junior, um, and that was like, actually, my dad still has the thing, which is fantastic, so every once in a while we'll kind of haul that out and play some games on it, but it was, um, my brother could not, he couldn't read yet. He was, he's about four and a half years younger than I was at the time, you know, he was, he was really young, but he would, he would be able to boot that game up because he watched us and memorized the sequence of the discs um, that we would put in. So he knew which ones went first and then he would go and play the game and uh, he actually learned how to read and read and write uh, from playing text parser games because he would ask us, okay, well, what, how do you spell this word? How do you spell this word? I'm surprised at how common of a theme that is, like how much these games taught people that perhaps didn't have English as a first language or were maybe slow to pick up on traditional English in school. They would be able to come home and play these games, transport themselves somewhere else and into not only a different land, but a, an entirely new language in that land. It, it's pretty that's cool. That's fantastic. I, I think that's really cool. I mean, that really... You know, as a former teacher myself, that I mean, really makes the case for, you know, learning that's motivated by, you know, a specific task. I mean, you're playing a game and you want to be able to continue to play the game. And that's uh, definitely a good motivator for um, for that kind of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I was curious. I mean, besides this one, because obviously we all love this game. What what's your what's your second favorite King Quest? Or, or if this isn't your your favorite, maybe like another one that you really, really like. No, no I, I would say mm. that this is my favorite. Um, I, I think second place is King's Quest VI, possibly okay. only mm. because I haven't actually finished it yet. But um, <laughs> that, <laughs> first, <laughs> that first third of it, and I always get stuck somewhere around the point, like the cliffs with the copy protection. I don't know why I always get stuck there, but <laughs> the cliffs um, of copy protection. Yes. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't. I don't know why, but I never really get past that point. Um, back when I was younger, so that's as far as I ever got. And uh, but I would say that up until that point, uh, it's already a better game, or at least it's already. I enjoyed it a lot more than uh, King's Quest 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 6 was whimsical and lovely and had a giant chessboard. So. And no Cedric. <laughs> Not even a little bit of Cedric. <laughs> Although I didn't uh, find him annoying when I had the voice version or the non-voice version. I didn't know he was annoying until I got out into the internet and found out that other people thought he was annoying. Mm -hmm. And so I went back and played it and I was like, oh, oh yeah, yeah, I can see that. And then I, I clicked and in the version I have, you can't click through the speech. They'll just keep talking <gasps> even though you've you're right. out of it clicking and telling them to stop and i'm like shit well there it is it is annoying oh man well hasn't he come I, I feel like he's almost gotten to the point where like he he's come full circle back to like <laughs> that's actually exactly what i was going to say an endearing totally. place you know yeah. <laughs> he's kind of become the unofficial mascot of the guild right now. yeah no that's i was actually just going to say that he is um it has completely turned around and he i he's like now i kind of regret that other games don't have him <laughs> where's the cedric <laughs> yeah i do find myself asking that a lot uh so you know yeah you're I just mean, like what I mean, would cedric all, no. do yeah what would cedric do he's sitting over there he'd be like well don't go over there and that's poisonous <laughs> and i'll be like you know what i'm just gonna go home and cedric be like yeah just go home you don't, you don't need to be doing this you're fine yeah, it's dangerous. <laughs> don't go near any it's snakes dangerous. and don't eat oh. anything that's food. That was pretty good, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I try. 
No, that was the thing. King's Quest V was just an exquisite. I just thought it was such a beautiful game. I, I really enjoyed the look of it, and I enjoyed mm-hmm. the story. Um, but in terms of puzzles, I think it's probably the least forgiving. Uh, mm-hmm. Maybe second to, to number three. But, like, man, if you don't throw a boot at a cat, like, <laughs> you know, at exactly, like, the right moment, like... And you just kind of go, "Ha! Huh, well, that was weird. That cat just ate a rat." Um, then you're you're just you're done. That's it. Game over, man. <laughs> it was my first hand painted game too. I'd never experienced graphics like that, so of course I was super stoked for it and and really blown away just by the looks of it. I I remember telling my friends, none of which were gamers, "This game is hand painted," and they'd be like, "People paint on the screen, like." <laughs> Nobody cared, but I thought it was really cool. <laughs> Wasn't there, I think in one of the uh, the Space Quest manuals, they, they said, yeah, we have hand-painted graphics. And there was like one of their artists, like with a literal paintbrush, like, like <laughs> on one of the the monitors. I don't remember oh, which one. Dude, or maybe it, was, it might have been that. from Interaction or something like that, or an early version of Interaction. I'm not sure, but Yeah. Random question, but do you guys remember that they used to have cartoon contests in in the Sierra? I don't know if it was Interaction. It might have been the Incarnation before Interaction, but the Sierra Magazine, whatever that was called at the time, they used to have this contest where you could draw cartoons. Mostly kids would do it. Draw cartoons based on the games, like funny cartoons, Mm -hmm. and they would get featured in the magazine. Oh, I only know about it because and, somebody posted a picture online that they had entered in oh. one of those. Oh. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think I entered one and I it was King's mm-hmm. Quest 4 and it was very bad, so obviously it never <laughs> saw the light of day, but um but yeah, I just remember going, "Oh man, I want to be featured in Sierra magazine," you know. <laughs> That's so cool. So you actually like you drew it and you sent it in. Like even that is just super cool. Yeah. Well, it's a vague memory, so I, I'm pretty sh- reasonably sure that I drew it. I just can't guarantee that I actually sent it in, or maybe and I'm just like sitting here and thinking about how I always wanted to, but like I it just <laughs> that was like apparently a big thing for me. Um, so yeah, I really loved those magazines when I was a kid. That was just mm-hmm. like the Sierra magazine would come, but like, oh man, I wish I could get all these games. Yeah, those I was like uh, eight and had no income, so. <laughs> yeah, there was that too. Um, yeah, Interaction was a great magazine. I, I only got it for like a year. I think it came mm-hmm. out like quarterly or mm-hmm. something like that. Yeah, and I, I can't remember exactly what it was. I think I like sent in a card at one point or another. And uh, I was just doing it because like the card told me, mail me in. I had no idea that it was actually like one of the perks of doing that was like a year subscription to oh, dude, Interaction. So, oh. so suddenly like these magazines start showing up. I'm like, huh? what Ooh. is <laughs> like, damn this is sweet this is all about sierra stuff that's amazing yeah we got the pc magazines but i didn't have that mm-hmm. and it was also really cool because they're the ones that um um my parents didn't get when they ran a magazine store so that's one you know it's a magazine that uh would not be stocked by stores or at least not here no i'd never seen it in person in my life mm-hmm we still have a few of them. I think most of them got purged at one point, but I found a couple at my parents' house. And then, of course, our, a lot of our big box stuff was the victim of a purge at one point before we ever mm. knew that keeping those would be cool. So, yeah. yeah. It's that moment when you think it's a great idea to put all your CDs and discs in containers and get rid of the boxes because yeah. they're just cluttery and I'm so smart. They take up so much space, <laughs> right? And now you're exactly. just like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I still have my original Black Cauldron. Aw. Ooh. Uh, my Black Cauldron box. Unfortunately, I don't have the map anymore. Oh, no. There was a beautiful map in that box. If any of you listeners have the map for the Black Cauldron game, let us know. And we will, uh, I don't know, maybe Sarah will buy it from you. She might. She literally <laughs> might. Because, like, I I want that. I want it. So any final thoughts on King's Quest Four? Well, the most, uh, one thing we haven't brought up yet is the day-night cycle. Like, oh my god, did it not blow your mind when all of a sudden it was nighttime? Yes! Oh my (laughs) gosh! 
<laughs> the fact that you can look at the clock and you can see that time is moving, like I don't know anybody who's ever stood there not on pause and had the night cycle come into play before they were ready for it. Like for me, whenever night came, I was prepared. I, I didn't get stuck in an unsolvable situation. How about you guys? Well, I'll say in terms of the um, day-night cycle taken by surprise, it kind of did, but kind of didn't, because like I said, I'd already played through most of the Quest for Glory games that were out at the time before I got oh, to this one. So, you so knew. it I didn't know. I, I was That's the thing. I was a little bit surprised that it would happen in a King's Quest, um, but it didn't blow my mind because I was already like, oh, that's really cool, but you know, this has already been happening for years for me. No big deal. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So my, I just texted my husband to bring the King's Quest Four box um, up to me so that I could see it. And yes, it says "complete day and night cycle." One of the features on the back. It's like, mm-hmm. woo! Actually, what are all I the don't... features? A uh, full-length cartoon introduction to the game, approximately ten minutes. That's pretty impressive. What do you think? That's only a three megabyte mm-hmm. game. Yeah, I looked it through. It's like just under nine minutes. It looks like they cut the time a bit, just like they cut the witches standing outside of the cage, but that's okay. No big deal. 40 minutes of original music composed and performed by William Goldstein. Represented beautifully through a PC speaker, but carry on. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) I actually really appreciated that um, they have, you know, this specific picture of Roberta Williams on the back is the Roberta Williams that talks to you if you die. Oh, right. So there's like yeah. that screen. And I think she's legit wearing the same sweater. <laughs> so they just took this picture. And then, yeah. I'm just not used to her wearing clothing. I usually see I usually see her on the cover of the soft porn adventure. <laughs> You're used oh, to her. I took it. That took me a minute. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> um, so I remember like sometimes if I died and like it was especially frustrating death, like falling down the, the stairs um, and, and I'm sitting here making a curling motion, like a twirly motion with my finger <laughs> that you cannot see. But what I'm trying to say is spiral staircase. <laughs> yes. If I fell off of that one too many times, she'd be like, sorry for playing. Next time, be more careful. And I would always get irritated. Like, I'm trying to be careful, lady. Jeez. Get off my back. <laughs> <laughs> you made the game yeah. like this. Come on. Isn't that something? Oh. It's like they make it deliberately really hard. And then as soon as you die, they're like, ooh, you idiot. You should have. Yeah, you tell me. You should have been more careful careful i'm like what do you think i'm doing <laughs> actually i really noticed that playing through space quest 4 again uh the other day is is no matter what you do if you do it right he's gonna make you feel a little bit silly for doing that but <laughs> that made him such a great narrator yeah <laughs> actually okay maybe this would be a good question as we're winding down rick i think we're, you said you're we're kind of running out of time but uh what is your favorite death in this game I don't really remember specifically. I, I guess the only one I really remember is uh, opening Pandora's box. But that mm-hmm. again, that really was entirely my fault. Like, I can't blame anyone but myself on that one. <laughs> it's all right. You just, you just gave my answer right oh. there. That was the, like the coolest death. Like as soon as you enter in that room and you save immediately because obviously you need to do that and yeah. you open the box and everything starts coming out and yeah that was a great death actually it's kind of funny now too when you think of um you know the whole all the ramifications of opening pandora's box and you know the world gets succumbs to evil and then roberta williams is sort of like yeah next time be more careful (laughs) (laughs) be more careful when opening the box (laughs) it's like you've released evil into the world next time don't do that yeah you know Oh, and I didn't mention earlier, now I know it's totally out of place, but like the baby crying upstairs was <gasps> Ooh, scary. And yes. your reflection in the mirror downstairs, every time you walk by, there's the shattered mirror and it catches your reflection as you walk by, always scared me as well. Mm. Oh, I really like the the rockabye baby in the minor key. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. And then the broken shovel, too. You you think you're doing it right, but you accidentally use the shovel in the wrong place just once somewhere else. And then you're like, yeah, I'm getting this. I saved it after every shovel dig. Oh, shovel broke. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right, say, right. How, yeah. which, how many save games back do I need to do to, exactly. to make this right? 
Darn it, why did I name them Anna 1, Anna 2, Anna 3, Anna 4, and Anna 5? <laughs> or like something like Butts. Like, see, that's my thing is like sometimes yeah. I'll just be like, this game is Butts and this is Butts 1 and Butts 2. And I'm like, you know, and, and you know, of course, I think I'm really funny. But of course, when you're trying to go back and actually figure out which one to use, it's, you know. It's like, oh, exactly. I'm, I'm, I already I'm a middle schooler. <laughs> <laughs> which, which butts is it? Um, yeah. I'd be so impressed if that actually like informed you. You're like, where am I going to? Oh yeah, butts. That's where. <laughs> <laughs> that's where I need to be right now. It's definitely the fourth butts, though. Yeah, I remember that because at the third butts, <laughs> I was just like before I went up on the island and I didn't have a peacock feather. So yes, <laughs> no, f- four butts. I associate those two things. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, I need to go back to butts four because it's just before butts five, but a <laughs> little bit after butts three. <laughs> yep, you've discovered my secret. I know the whole world is going to know how mature I am. <laughs> <laughs> You heard it here first. Yep, yep. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any final, final thoughts or shout outs? Yeah. I mean, uh, shout out to Roberta Williams for making a cool set of games. And then, you know what? Saying, fuck it. I'm going to do whatever it is I want to do to live my life. Like, I've given you more fun than a lot of other people have. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm going to write books and sail boats. And I super do per respect uh, everything she did. My God, that woman was a forerunner uh, for video games in the 1980s. And uh, sure as hell amused and frustrated me and (laughs) gave me emotions, which, you know, that's pretty cool. Some lady I've never met gave me emotions and feelings when I was a kid, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I'd have to say I I was going to say something along those lines, too. I... She, um, gosh, I love that she designed these. She made me, she made me terrified, guilty, (laughs) happy, (laughs) triumphant when I finally figured out some of these puzzles. And I I read a recent article that kind of talked about how she really got started because Ken gave her Colossal Cave Adventure to play and she just like latched on to those crazy puzzles. And that's part of the reason why the puzzles are the way they are in King's Quest. And she challenged us and she was a trailblazer and and I'm a big fan of women like Roberta Williams and Lori Cole. They are doing and have done things with their lives that are a little bit on the unconventional side for women. And, you know, growing up, not a lot of girls I knew played computer games. And these women were designing them and building these mm-hmm. worlds that I got to grow up, you know, running around in. And uh, that kind of gave me permission to to be, you know, them and women like them gave me permission to be who I am, to like the things that I like, and to not worry about it if it was different from what a lot of other women like. Um, and, uh, you know, that's why I was so excited when I found the guild and found Ladies Night. I'm like, here are the women. <laughs> there they are. <laughs> I they knew were y'all there. were out there. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. She, uh, I know we're at the end, but whatever, here I am. Roberta was asked a question in an interview uh, that was done probably about 12 years ago. And the question was, how is it you feel or you felt being a woman in a male dominated field back in a time where there weren't any other female developers? And she said, you know, to be honest, at the time, I didn't really think about it this way. Uh, they wanted mm-hmm. to work with me and uh, they enjoyed my company. I thought they were funny and, and I didn't think about it as girls versus boys. And, and to touch back to my last interview with you, Rick, when you asked me the same question, mm-hmm. how did it feel being a female gamer in a time where it was mostly guys that were playing games? And I felt the same way. I don't think I noticed mm-hmm. that I was a female gamer or any different from any other gamer. I was just one of the few that played computer games. Mm-hmm. You know, I think I think I was I think you know you and I were kind of lucky because I I didn't mm-hmm. really run into that. I don't think I noticed those differences until much later. Um mm-hmm. but initially, I don't think I really thought about it that much either. Mhm. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Thank you all for joining us again. And uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the Classic Gamers Guild will be holding a fundraiser on Saturday, March 28th, 2020. Uh, Please follow us on Facebook and Twitter 
and we will keep you informed on the details about that. And all donations and proceeds will be going to help Stephen Alexander of Infamous Quests, who is um, currently uh, suffering from kidney failure and is on dialysis. It really is quite a hard thing to go through, and the uh, medical bills are piling up. We'll be giving you a lot of updates and information about that in the coming weeks, so uh, we hope to see you there. And um, in the meantime, don't do a murder.